Our text this morning is Titus chapter 3. These are the words of God. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, and that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition, reject, knowing that he that is, is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. When I shall send Artemis unto thee, or Tychicus, be diligent to come unto me to Nicopolis, for I have determined there to winter. Bring Zenus the lawyer and Apollos on their journey diligently, that nothing be wanting unto them. And let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. All that are with me salute thee. Greet them that love us in the faith. Grace be with you all, and amen. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank you for your word to us. We thank you that you poured out your spirit on that day of Pentecost. You filled your people with tongues of flame. You filled them with the rushing wind of your spirit that they might proclaim uh, your, your marvelous works, the wonderful works of God unto all nations, tribes, and tongues. We pray now that as your word goes forth by your spirit, by the comforter that you sent forth to us, you would prick our hearts. You would uh, comfort us with your word. You would correct us. You would rebuke us. You would build us up in this most holy faith that we might come at last uh, to your heavenly kingdom. We pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus, and amen. amen. We're wrapping up the, our, our, our working through the book of Titus. We come to the final chapter here. And I want you to think for a moment about a project that you started that seemed daunting, that seemed like it's never going to get done. Around about this time of year, on, our, on the back slope of our, of our property is a hill full of weeds. And every, every spring about this time, they start to show themselves as not just you know, greenery, but they start showing the thorns and the thistles. And once more, I remember, yes, it's time to get out the, the big guns, the, 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 the biggest hedge trimmers and weed whackers and flamethrowers I can muster uh, to, to, to tame this uh, back patch that's full of weeds. And it seems daunting at first, right? And you, you, you can oftentimes, or if you look at the garage full of, full of junk that needs to be cleaned out, it can be daunting to figure out where to start. Or after some uh, big fellowship meal, some uh, Thanksgiving dinner, you, you look at the pile of dishes and you go, you sigh and think, oh, I don't feel like starting on that just yet. Think of, think of a project that you, you know needs to get done and it looks daunting and, 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 and the emotion that you feel uh, mustering up the strength to figure out where do I even start with this. Well, as the saying goes, the way to eat an elephant is one bite at a time. And this is in part, I think, what Paul, uh, Paul has some genius here in regards to uh, the, the reformation and the advance of the gospel into all the world. Uh, he's, he's identified this island of Crete as, as a strategic point, as a strategic a location in the battle for conquering the world with the gospel of Jesus. Paul's vision for the church of Crete was not narrow in scope. It wasn't just that they would have nice quiet times each morning with sipping their coffee and have warm fuzzies in their heart, and it would have no effect beyond that moment. 
Paul's vision for what was going to take place as uh, the, the, the Christians on Crete put into practice and were set in order by the diligent teaching of Titus and the other men we learn at the end here who are assigned to carry on this faithful work. As, as these men are given the task of setting things in order, as it says, affirming these things constantly, Paul's vision was that if the Christians would put these things into place and would live these things out, would be faithful in good works, would be fruitful in good works, this island would be a strategic beachhead in the war for the advancement of the gospel into all the earth. It wasn't narrow in scope. This isn't just a, a, a page out of Paul's journal that we just so happened to procure. This is a vision for how society, anywhere and any time, might be reformed. He wasn't just trying to get them to have more polite manners at the dinner table. This letter is an instruction manual for a culture war, bringing the gospel, the culture of the gospel of Jesus Christ to bear upon the darkness and the dead works of, of Crete. Or name your location, name the, 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 name the battlefield, name, name the, the, the place where things have gotten hurly and burly and, and all out of order. This is Paul's strategy for, for looking at the, the big, dark project, the, the vast uh, uh, property that is to be taken and conquered. And this is Paul's strategy for how to take it. Titus is tasked here throughout this, this epistle, as we've looked at it, is tasked with laying the groundwork for conquering the globe with the gospel, starting in Crete. Crete may be a mess, but if the wind of God blows, as we, as we heard in our Old Testament reading this morning, if, if the wind of God blows upon the dry bones, the dry bones can't help but live and move once more and become a great army to overtake the world. So I want to walk through this, uh, this chapter and then make some applications and observations uh, to our lives and to our moment. Uh, Paul's movement throughout the book is just by way of summary, if you missed the first two messages in this series, uh, Paul's movement of thought has gone from starting in chapter one, he identifies that elders and their households, he begins very specifically with saying to Titus, set in order, set godly men in order who have their houses in order, that their, their character and their qualifications are their households, the, the, the faithfulness in their homes and in their own lives. Uh, he, he focuses in, set these elders in place and each city there on the island of Crete, chapter 1, 6 through 9. He focuses in there saying, this is how we're going to start. We're going to start with faithful men who can carry on the gospel and teach the gospel, uh, starting in their own homes and moving outward to the, to the general church, which we see in the next chapter. He's, he expands the circle just from, from elders in their households, and it's expanded to Christian households in general. He gives instructions to older men and older women and then younger women and, and younger men and then slaves. And now he broadens the circle once more. Uh, he circles it a third time to encompass all Christians' duties as citizens. There in verses 1 through 3. He gives instructions as to how to live um, in, in, in honor and respect to the authorities, uh, the civil authorities that God has placed over you. The, the, their mindset in regards to uh, the civil magistrate is to be ready for good works, to not be uh, slow in obeying good works, good commands, good laws. Uh, unlike unlike the, the legendary poem, which we, we saw at the beginning of the book, they, they shouldn't be um, uh, liars and gluttons and, and, and slow bellies, evil beasts. Rather, they should be the sort of citizens that are eager, eager to bring about good works. Um, and this will be a blessing, of course, to their, uh, to their, um, uh, their, their civil leaders. Now, a little bit about Crete. Um, so it's an island nation, and as an island nation that has lots of these harbors, it was sort of a, a crossroads of sort. It was it had a many busy harbors, and it was the home of many mercenaries and pirates and what we might call riffraff. It, it, it's not the cream of the crop of society. It's not high class. The population of Crete, as we noted earlier in the earlier parts of the book, it's, it's noted for its villainy. It's noted for its duplicity and its gluttony and its, and its sexual immorality. But Christians are tasked here in verses 1 through 3 in regards to their civil duties, they're tasked with living in stark contrast to that way of doing things. They should live in mindful submission to the magistrate, eager for good works, eager to bring about good works, to do good works. Verse 1. 
And they should refuse to join in the coarse banter and brawling, uh, the, the rough and tumble of this unbelieving populace. They, they shouldn't be sucked into the, to the rivalries. What, what does he say in verse 3? That the, the, the sort of Girardian tug of war of hating and hating one another, the constant rivalries and envies and battles and brawling, uh, the Christians are not to get sucked into this, uh, this, this way of doing things. Instead, they should be marked by gentleness coupled with meekness or harnessed strength. Verse 2, they should have strength. Meekness isn't a docility. Meekness is a horse with a bridle in its mouth. It's strength directed in the right course. They are to be meek. They are to have a strength that could come to blows if need be, but it's, it's harnessed. It's dutiful. It's, it's obedient um, to God's law and to, if, uh, to the magistrates and authorities that have been placed over it. The dissolute life that they and Paul once lived, described in verse 3, has been washed away. Paul says, for, for we ourselves were, were this way. And he goes on to describe all the gnarly uh, wickedness uh, and, and darkness that describes the life before Christ. He, but this has been washed away by, by what? What, what washes us away? Is it, it just being nice and tidy, uh, cleaning up nicely for Sunday mornings? No, it's, he, he's washed. They're, they're washed not by uh, any, any works of man, but they're washed by the love and kindness of God appearing. There in verse 4. This salvation, of course, is not by works. It's a striking thing that throughout this book, the summons to good works is like a, a drumbeat, a self-control and good works and diligence in, in, um, in your duties as a slave or as a mother or as a husband or as a father, as, a, as an older woman or as an older man. All these duties, all these good works are laid out. And, and yet along with it comes this, this steady symphony of not by works are you saved. This salvation, this washing is not by your works, it's by mercy. The twofold mercy is described here as the regenerative washing and the renewing work of the Holy Ghost, there in verse 5. So all these good works are the result of a regenerative washing and renewing work of the Holy Ghost. This mercy comes to us, of course, in abundance. He sheds it upon us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, there in verse 6. And all the exhortations to good works throughout this epistle should be couched in this high-octane gospel in verse 7. All, all, the, all, the, all the summons to live this way. Knock it off, guys. Don't be cretins. Don't be uh, uh, evil beasts. Don't be slow bellies. Don't be liars. All the summons to leave their sin is couched in this high-octane gospel there in verse 7. This is the gospel. This is the engine that will make it work. That being justified by his grace. This, this is the good news that makes it all work. Your good works will only be good works, will only arise and be good works if it is first couched in this free justification that comes to you by the, by the free and sovereign grace of God. The, the kindness and the love of God being shed upon you abundantly in this washing and renewing work of the Holy Ghost. This is the only way that good works are going to be pulled off. But this justification, notice, makes us something. It makes us heirs of God the Father and the eternal life which is found in his son, Jesus Christ. If you flip over to, to the book of 1 John, there's this wonderful line that, that the apostle John gives us in a similar manner. 1 John 5, 12. It's, it's so simple, so wonderfully simple and beautiful in its simplicity. 1 John 5, 12. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that does not have the Son of God hath not life. In other words, God has shed upon us abundantly his Son. And, and that means if you have the Son, you have life. You have life to do these good works. You have the spirit dwelling in you to do everything you've just been told to do. The glory of the gospel should cause those who believe it to maintain good works. Verse 8 and verse 14, it's like 
Paul is just making sure. I really want to make sure you guys don't miss this. Verse 8, that these might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. And then again in verse 14, let ours, let those who are of the faith, also learn to what? Maintain good works. Don't be lazy. Don't slack off. Don't neglect these things. Get to work. Uh, Get to work because of this triune grace that has been poured out upon you. Isn't it wonderful that in that, that those verses that are describing the, the grace and the mercy that's poured out upon us, it's this wonderful uh, uh, picture of the Trinity, of God the Father sending forth his Son, shedding, uh, sh- uh, shedding upon us abundantly the grace and favor of God the Father upon us through Christ, and then the Spirit washing us and renewing us that we might walk in these good works, all to bring us to be heirs once more of the Father. The Father sends the Son, the Son sends the Spirit, the Spirit fills us that we might come to the Father, that we might be certain, I'm a child of God. My baptism says about me, he belongs to Christ. He belongs to God, the Father. This point of maintaining good works is clearly important because Paul then again repeats it again, like I noted in in verse 14, to maintain good works and do not be unfruitful. Receive what God has given you and put it into play. Believing in God and being careful to maintain good works is good and profitable unto mankind. And I think this is what Paul has in view for the subversion of the the Cretan way of doing things, the corrupt way of doing things that the people of Crete were used to and which the false teachers, as I noted before, they were subverting whole households, turning things topsy-turvy in regards to how a, a faithful home should look they were subverting things, and Paul says, I've got an idea for how to, how to subvert this whole project. If the church is faithful to put these good works into, into practice, this will be profitable to all men. There in verse 8b, this is how the church subverts the ungodly world. Paul then gives instructions as to the, the, the immediate question is going to be, well, what about these guys that are sort of lingering in our midst, teaching all these kind of bizarre doctrines? What do we do about them? H- how do we make sure that they don't, they're not too cozy in our midst? So Paul gives instructions as to what to do about the false teachers and what we might call the, the division specialists. This is the, the one time we have the word heretic used in Scripture. What do we do about these false teachers and division specialists who are bothering the church? Were he writing to us, I think his instructions might sound something like, don't spend much, if any, time arguing in YouTube comment threads. It's unprofitable. All these squabbles uh, about whether Zeus's birthplace really was on Crete, and if perhaps you were descended from him, so I'll get to more of that in a, in a little bit. But, but the, the legend was that Crete was the island where Zeus was, was born and was raised. And so the speculation might be, hey, that's a, that's a big, strong guy over there. Maybe he's descended from Zeus. Or, or the Jews who are mingling in all sorts of genealogies of the Old Testament and, and having some really weird extrapolations of, of what that means. I remember hearing before of, of some people that try to uh, t- take all the meaning of the names and the genealogies and construct some sort of story or sentence. And while there's some really interesting and profitable things to be learned there, you can get so sucked into uh, uh, some imaginative renderings that it becomes unprofitable. It becomes an excuse to neglect your kids. It becomes an excuse to not go mow the lawn. It becomes an excuse not to go help your neighbor. It becomes an excuse not to show hospitality. Because you're all wrapped up in these very mystical and interesting uh, side pursuits, these, these distractions, these unprofitable pursuits that were uh, uh, clearly taking up a lot of time. And so these households were not being profitable. They weren't being uh, eager and diligent in good works. They also, these false teachers were uh, speculating on what each specific angel did or how thin could you actually slice the plain law of Moses. All of this, he says in verse 9, is unprofitable. And so verse 10 and, verses 10 and 11 gives us the only reference in the New Testament to a heretic, which is someone who is divisive, someone who is uh, trying to, to separate from, separate the body of Christ. And, and then what to do about him. Paul says very simply, rebuke him a time or two, and then let him fall headlong into his self-deception. He is himself subverted. 
he, he's subverted himself. He's, he's deluded with all these daydreams such that he's just not going to be helpful at all. Don't, don't let him in on the project. So Paul then closes his letter with some final practical details, some instructions, and final blessings of true Christian love and prayers for grace upon the, the Cretan church, verses 12 through 15. Now, one detail that, that's notable here in this, in this closing that we shouldn't overlook, it's one of those really interesting how much you can actually pull out of the, the stuff that we oftentimes just skim really quickly past. Um, Paul expects Titus to kind of get all this, the, the framework for all this put in place in enough time to be able to join him in Nicopolis by winter. You'll notice that in verse 12 that he says, hey, I'm going to send Artemis and Ortychicus unto, unto you, and they're going to replace you and keep, keep the work going, but I want you to make sure you get to me, to Nicopolis, for I've determined there to winter. So the island of Crete, and then you have the coast of Greece, and Nicopolis is sort of like up further north on the coast of Greece, whereas Crete is an island there in the, in the Mediterranean. And so it's not like a hop, skip, and a jump over there. And so Paul says, Titus, get all this in place, and make sure to get here by, uh, by Christmas time. He expects him to get all this in place by winter. Other men will take over what Titus began. And this is really an encouraging thought, I think, that's found here. A true reformation doesn't need a whole lot of time to get started, even though it will take this generational faithfulness that's alluded to throughout the book will sustain it. Now, I notice I want to make a couple observations and, and some applications here. As I noted, uh, the speculation surrounding the island of Crete was that it was the birthplace of the god Zeus. So some Greek mythology is actually at play here in the background of this epistle. As the legend went, a cave on Crete was believed to be the place where Zeus's mother hid him from his father, Kronos. Uh, if you know anything about Kronos, he had devoured all his previous children. Uh, a, charming, a charming god to worship, is he not? Uh, a, a, a father god who devours his children. They're not too far off. The, the demons they were worshiping are devouring demons. So Kronos had devoured all his, his previous children, and so the mother realized, I better hide this son away. And so Zeus is, is apparently hid away on one of, the island, one of the caves there in Crete. So Zeus has been hid away, raised in Crete. And once, once he's strong enough, he overthrows his father. He, he gains his strength and he goes and does battle with his father. He delivers his siblings from his father's stomach. And then, by them casting lots, it's, de it's decided that he gets to rule on Mount Olympus. This rule of Mount Olympus was given over to Zeus. And so many on Crete believe that they were possible descendants of this titan, this god. The, the, the blood of deity ran in their veins, perhaps. Thus, the fables of lineage captured the social imagination there on the island of Crete. But along comes the rival story of the gospel. It's, it's notable that uh, we, we had in the New Testament reading this morning the description of the day of Pentecost. And if you notice in there, there were people from the island of Crete there at the day of Pentecost, which is likely the seed which, which formed the early church there on this island. And so along comes a rival story to the, to the citizens of Crete, a rival myth, and one that conveniently happens to be true. It's the true myth, as C.S. Lewis calls it. God the Father sent his Son. The Christ died in their stead, died in your stead, washed you with covenantal waters and renews us by his indwelling spirit. He, he gives us his life. He gives us this divine inheritance. And all of this means that those who trusted in Christ were made true heirs of the eternal life of God. The speculation as to whether we here on the island of Crete, we are descended from the gods, or we have the honor and privilege of being the home of the birthplace of the great god Zeus, all of that is put to rest by this rival myth, this myth that is true, this, this story that comes of, of God who sent his son to give us freely, th through no, through no ex exploits of your own, through no heroics of your own, but the, the, the life of God is given to you. You were made an heir 
and are partaker of this eternal life of God. The divine life is yours, not by fables, but by faith. This gospel is a potent story which upends dominant cultural narratives of their day. This divine life is yours because you have received a new paternity. In regeneration, this, this reference to regeneration and is an important one in our, in our uh, systematic theology, the ordo salutis, the order of salvation. How does it work when God uh, elects to save us, when God sets about to save an individual? What does the process look like? How does that come about? This, this doctrine of regeneration is a vital one. It's, it's a, a link in the golden chain that can't be removed. But what is it exactly? This regeneration, in regeneration, what happens? In, in, in simple terms, God becomes your father. This takes place when you are washed in Christ and renewed by his spirit. And none of this, of course, is by your own doing. Any more than your birth, your natural birth, was by your doing. It isn't obtained by your striving to get it from your father, wrestling with God, your father, to try to obtain this eternal life from him. As if you were a, a New Testament Zeus, none of this is by your doing. It isn't obtained by your striving to get it from your father. Rather, it comes to you by his grace and favor alone. Your father is not a devourer like Kronos. Your father gives you himself by giving you his son. If you look back in, in chapter 2, it says that explicitly. Uh, it says that the, the, we, we live... It, live out these good works uh, by looking forward to the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And well, how does it describe what, what God did through Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Your father gives you himself because he gives you his son. And each Lord's Day, as we gather around the table, we partake of this renewing grace of the Spirit. God feeds you with Christ. God feeds you with the eternal life, as it were, of his Son. At Pentecost, as I mentioned earlier, there were some Cretans who were present. They likely formed the initial formation of the believers on Crete, the, the initial church there on the island of Crete. But we might ask, as I, as I asked earlier, in this project to take over the world with the gospel, why did Paul single out this island of scoundrels and scallywags as, as worth devoting some of his best resources, some of his most reliable men are assigned to this island? The harbors of Crete were one of the main crossroads of the Mediterranean. And Paul identified correctly that if these lymph nodes of commerce were conquered, if these crossroads of the world were conquered, it would have a dis disproportionate impact on the gospel effort to take over the world. If, if by the church's faithfulness in these harbor towns full of pirates, full of scallywags, full of the worst of society, if the church is successful in eagerly living out good works such that society is turned and culture is turned and, and many of these scallywags become saints... What would it be when the world looks at the island of Crete and sees no longer an island full of liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies, but faithful households, faithful homes, loving husbands and wives, faithful children, patient servants, and good citizens? It would make them scratch their head. It would make the watching world scratch their head and say, surely the Lord is in the midst of them. But like the hymn puts it, the strategy to take over the world is not with swords loud clashing or roll of stirring drums, but with deeds of love and mercy, the heavenly kingdom comes. This overthrow will come by the Christian church being vibrantly and very simply alive. They, they have to be alive in order to pull this off. The gracious gift of the gospel is followed by the good works of the Spirit, as one commentator put it, grace in the heart cannot exist without good works as their consequent. Meaning if, if the true grace of God has been poured out upon you, it, it, it cannot help but produce fruit. It cannot help but produce these good works that are expected. And, and not that we measure our salvation by, by whether 
we've done enough good works, but we, we expect that when grace appears, when the gospel takes root in your life, that what, what will happen other than how might I glorify God in my, in my role, in my duty as a husband, father, mother, wife, child, servant, or citizen. We should also lay stress here upon the fact that Paul's vision, his, his gospel which he, he's preaching is not an escapist mentality. It's not a go off into the woods. It's not a go off into the cave sort of gospel. He insists that these good works are to be done publicly. Do this in front of all men. Live these things out before all men. This will be profitable unto all men. Don't, don't be like these, these false teachers who are lazing about teaching all their speculative doctrines. Be diligent in good works. This is fruitful. This is profitable unto man. He insists these good works are to be done publicly, in the civil sphere, in your neighborhood, with an aim to bring about the total reformation of the culture of Crete. God's favor throughout this book has been described and depicted in some wonderful terms. The kindness and love of God is how it's described here in this chapter. In the previous chapter, chapter 2, verse 13, it's described this, this favor of God is described as the blessed hope to which we look. In, in chapter 1, at the very opening, it's described the, the hope of eternal life manifested in the preaching of Christ. Once this grace, this favor of God, the kindness of God that you are hearing now and throughout the ages, God has raised up preachers to declare this wonderful mystery of godliness, that Christ died in your stead. That you are no longer dead in your trespasses and sins, but God, by his great kindness and favor, freely gives you an inheritance, an inheritance of eternal life, an inheritance of his spirit dwelling in you. It will, and, and if this grace takes root in your heart, in the harbors of your heart, in the harbors of your society, if this grace takes root in the harbors, it will overthrow empires. Paul's strategy works at every level, from the individual to the empire. The, the question I asked earlier, where's the mess? What, what, what's the big task that's facing you? What works do you know that you need to be busy doing? Where is the mess that maybe you've made through your sin? Look at our culture and see the, the carnage that's been wrought through the sexual revolution, abortion, our, our, our leaders last night deciding we can spend as much money as we want for the next two years. What could go wrong? Where is the mess? Well, it's here. Here's the mess. Here's the room full of mess. Here's a nation full of mess. And that's where God's grace will appear. Not to leave the mess as it is. No. Through Christ, abundance of grace is shed upon you. This, this washing of regeneration is shed upon you. And the Holy Spirit is given to you to bring renewal. To use but one example, the dead frost of winter, when the gospel comes, when the light of the gospel dawns, the, the dead frost of winter gives way to the fresh renewal of life of spring. The Spirit brings renewal of life. You are born again, not by, not by perishable seed, but by the living and abiding word of God. And as this comes to life, by the Spirit, it is renewed day by day. An infant isn't born and start running right away. An infant is born and then it is nursed and nurtured and fed and cared for that day by day its strength might be renewed until it comes to maturity. But it should be noted, the, the description that Paul gives to us, that the contrast with the scallywags, the contrast with the other way, the, 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 the atomic way of doing things, is dead. Dead men have dead works. The wicked men, as noted in chapter 1, were subverting others' households through sexual immorality and through their, their tall tales and their fables. And they were subverting others' households, we learn here in this chapter, because they themselves were subverted. There in verse 11. These, these heretics, these men who were self-indulgent, they were, he is... Verse 11, knowing that he, this heretic, these, these false teachers, that such, they're subverted. 
they're, they're topsy-turvy. They're turned inside out and sinneth, being condemned of himself. Sin is self-delusion. And Paul includes himself there in verse 3. He says, for we ourselves were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. That's the way it is without Christ. That's the way it is when you're dead in your trespasses and sins. Sin is self-delusion. Paul includes himself. He says, for we ourselves were once this way. Every time you sin, you in effect are saying, you are the fool saying in your heart, there is no God. Jesus told the Pharisees that by rejecting him as Messiah, the appointed prince, they were showing that their father was the devil. Sin is unfruitfulness. Sin is dead work. Sin is the result of being a descendant of Adam and his capitulation to Satan. But the Spirit comes. It being Pentecost Sunday, like I noted last week, I picked out to preach through Titus and had it looked at the calendar, and it's wonderful how the Lord works to match this all up perfectly. The Spirit comes. The Spirit brings the regenerating, renewing grace. He brings life. He brings a second generation. You were born, yes, of your father Adam, but now through the washing and regeneration of the Holy Spirit, the renewal of the Holy Spirit, you are given a new paternity. God owns you as a child. Notice that Pentecost wasn't followed by the idleness of corpses. The Spirit comes, the the rushing wind blows, the fire descends, and the, the church fans out with zeal and energy and vigor for good works. to to serve and to proclaim the gospel, to proclaim the risen Christ, to worship him faithfully. It wasn't followed by the idleness and laziness and indulgence of dead corpses, rather with the activity that comes through a new birth. Look at all that Paul says needs to be done here. Look at the daunting task of reforming a, a, a corrupt culture like Crete. Look at all the tasks given to young women and young men and and slaves and and all the the duties of elders to fight these false teachers, to stop their mouths as we saw in chapter 1. Look at all the duties. Look at all the, the tasks needing to be done. And then think, how can this be done? How could all this happen? How can the world be transformed by this grace? How can it all be? How can the distant islands come to worship at Christ's throne? How can, how can we turn this ship around of our nation or of our town or of our family or of my, of my individual life? How can we turn this around? How can this be done unless and only if the saints receive the life giving power of the Spirit? Your baptism tells you two things. First, you were once dead in Adam, and so none of your righteousness will suffice. That's what Paul tells us there in verse 5, not by works of righteousness which you have done. Secondly, though, your baptism tells you something else. Paul tells us here that you are washed. You're washed, as the old hymn says, you're washed in the blood. You're washed in the, the waters of your baptism, and it tells you something. It tells you God is your father. You are an heir. Regeneration is not a matter of subjective feelings and trying to get into some emotional frame of mind and then trying to hold on and bottling up that subjective feeling. But regeneration is the objective work of the spirit which renews you. Christ washes you, the Spirit renews you, and the Father welcomes you and calls you a child. You are washed in wave after wave of the free grace of God through Christ. And then the Spirit, living within you, promised to you the the earnest of your inheritance, the earnest that you will live forever in the presence of God Almighty, the great joy that is in His presence, the promise that that is yours is renewed to you day by day by the Spirit, week by week, year by year, until at last you come to your heavenly rest. The Spirit renews you day by day, week by week, to bear the fruit of God's life in you. 
And so baptized in Christ, you can know that God is your Father. Renewed by the Spirit, you are told then to get to work, taking over the world with this abundant life which Christ has given you. Let's pray. Our good and gracious Father, we thank you for the almighty power of your Spirit, which is at work even in us. We who have received uh, the, the washing of our baptism, the washing of Christ, uh, faith in Christ, we thank you that you have washed us, cleansed us, renewed us, that we might take hold of eternal life. Lord, we thank you for washing us, renewing us. I pray that you would give us grace to put all these good works that Paul explains here and elsewhere in Scripture. I pray you would give us grace and strength to put these things into practice. I pray you would make us diligent to root up and tear down the the towers of sin and, and corruption that linger in our own hearts by the power of your Spirit, expecting them to be conquered by his power. Lord, we pray all this, praying back to you the words our Lord Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Some shroud this meal in mystery and dark clouds of unknowable mists. It is thought that the sacrament should be vague and shadowy and and too high for the common man to contemplate. But this is contrary to the entire warp and woof of Scripture's revelation. In the wonderful works of God, His Spirit always brings the light of glory. When God made the world, the Trinity in unity was at work. The Father presiding and speaking, the Word upholding, and the Spirit bringing light and life in the darkness and formlessness of the world. Once more, when God cut a covenant with Abram, the glory of the Spirit appeared as a smoking furnace and burning pot passing through the divided animals, bringing covenantal light and assurance to Abram. To a thousand generations, God's blessing was promised to this man who had come out from Ur of the Chaldees. When Moses set up the tabernacle and all was in accordance with God's revealed will on Sinai, fire light fell showcasing that God's presence would indeed dwell in the midst of his people. And once again at Solomon's temple, the firelight of the Spirit consumed the sacrifice and filled the temple with radiant glory. All of this was foreshadowing the glory fire that came to dwell within us by Christ sending forth his Spirit on the glorious day of Pentecost. In the coming of the Spirit, the firelight of God's glory had come. Christ's earthly work and ministry in obedience to the Father, was ratified by the tongues of fire on Pentecost. True comfort had come, for the Comforter had come to dwell in all of God's people. In this meal, the glory light of the Spirit descends to shine once more. As we behold the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, the Spirit shines in us as we taste the bread of assurance and drink the wine of gospel comfort. And so come in faith and welcome to Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank you that the the tongues of fire fell that day of Pentecost. The rushing wind of your spirit blew through the the upper room, filling your people, filling the disciples with with gospel strength to proclaim your, your gospel to all the ends of the world. We thank you that this is a testimony of the great power and work of our Lord and Savior Jesus, his body broken, his blood poured out on our behalf. We give thanks for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So the charge is this, the the letter to Titus is an instruction manual for cultural reformation, and we certainly have our work cut out for us, both individually and our families and our culture, but Paul gives uh, you the gospel hope for how to turn the tide. So ask yourself this, has Jesus washed me? If so, you are a child, you are an heir, you have the spirit which assures you that you can call God Abba Father, and so get to work. Listen listen to the last verse of one of those hymns we just sang. Finish then thy new creation, pure and spotless let us be. Let us see thy great salvation perfectly restored in thee. Changed from glory into glory, till in heaven we take our place, till we cast our crowns before thee, lost in wonder, love, and praise. And so get to work with that ringing in your heart and your minds. And hear hear now the benediction of God your Father with open hands and believing hearts. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever and amen. Amen.